Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, welcome back. We are moving on to the second half of today. A lot of the first half was some conceptual background on fMRI, an introduction to AFNI, and what we just did was we ran a pre-processing script which did a bunch of things to your data. Primarily, it ran through all of those pre-processing steps that I outlined in the previous lecture. So, for example, it removed TRs if it, if it had to. It did things like slice time correction, motion correction, normalization, registration. It also ran through a first-level analysis, which is the focus of this next module. But before we move on to that, let's take a look at the process data. Take a look you know, before and after each step to get a sense of you know, whether it looks right or not. So you should see something like this. This is some output that AFNI gives as a summary for, for different uh, quality checks. We're not going to go over all of them. We're going to be mostly looking at different parts of the processing pipeline. So you should still be in the sub-01 directory. And if you type ls, what this script did was create a new directory called sub01.results. All of you are actually in the home directory if you had to re-log in. Oh, OK. Yeah, if you re-logged in, you're in the home directory. So go into flanker, sub01, type ls, so that we're on the same, same page here. OK. Anybody need time to catch up? All right. So we're all in this directory, and now let's type cd sub01.results and press enter. Now, if you type ls, there is quite a bit here. I'm going to try to get it into two-column format. All right. So there's a lot. Just scroll through it, see how much there is there. And I'm going to single off your attention this black over here, which shows what happens at each pre-processing step. Remember, we had two conditions. We had, or sorry, we had two runs of data. Pretty small data set. Usually you have more than two runs. But it's a pretty small data set, and it's manageable. And notice that it starts out with PB00. Zero, zero. That's, you know, in AFNI, they index starting from zero. So zero is the first, say, subric is the first step. That's how they're going to do their notation. And PB stands for processing block. Now, this, this script that I gave you, this, this mystery script, we're going to unpack it a little bit. Um, it was generated using this Uber subject script, which I'll show you during the lecture. But this is the output after everything has been done. So really, um, you know, after you've entered everything to Uber subject.py and you run it, you should get something like this no matter what kind of data set you run it on. It's going to do more or less all these, these basic processing steps. So uh, how to approach this, how to make sense of it. The first thing we're going to do is open up the AFNI viewer by typing AFNI and hitting return. And notice how with underlay now we have many, many different options to choose from. And these different processing blocks represent different things that, that happen during pre-processing. So tcat, that's removing any TRs if we need to. Uh, the default here was not to remove anything because, as we saw looking at the data originally, we didn't need to remove anything. T-shift is slice dynamic correction. Volreg is volume registration. So that's aligning the, uh, it's doing the motion correction and also registering your T1 to your T2 image. Blur is smoothing. And then scale is another processing step I didn't cover before. But basically, it's scaling all of your signal to have a mean of 100 in each voxel. The reason we do that is so that any deflections that we see from 100, we can say roughly represents percent signal change. So we're putting everything on the same scale so that anybody else reports a change in signal, we're basically on the same, same playing field. Yeah. So let's take a look at what some of these look like. So we're still on underlay. Um, let's see, probably, so nothing happens during TCAT. There's not really going to be anything noticeable that happens during T-shift, but um, let's take a look at that. Anyway, before you hit apply, 
click on graph first. And, you know, click on any part of the brain. doesn't really matter. We're just going to see if there's really any change. Um, so what's loaded right now by default is that first step. So R1.tcat is what we're seeing right here. More or less our raw data. We haven't done anything to it yet. Now if you click on T-Shift Apply, this probably, it probably didn't make a big change. This is what I was talking about where, you know, I really don't see a difference either using or not using slice time and correction. If it does make a change, it's very, very subtle, so you probably won't see much, if at all, from one to the other. Now, where you actually will sort of see some changes and where we can actually start to uh, see whether there's something we need to troubleshoot or go back and fix is when we get into uh, volume registration. So click on R01.Volreg, click Apply, and notice it seemed to change uh, the shape of this. This is because in AFNI, there's a command called 3D Alineate that does a bunch of steps simultaneously. It's going to run your motion correction, and it is also going to do registration from uh, the T2 image to your anatomical image. So to see whether it actually did a good job of doing that, remember what we did where we had the overlay and the underlay for the original anatomical and the skull strip anatomical, right? That was a basic check just to make sure that the, the skull stripping did what it should have. We can do a similar thing here. So first of all, I simply, you know, look around here, make sure there are no major distortions that happened. And then for overlay, select overlay. And for this, I'm going to select, let's see here, what would be a good one? Anat final. All right. Everybody see something like this? Okay, so it seems like there's an outline in, in green here. Doesn't really make sense, right? So how do we actually determine whether the registration did a good job or not? Again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to click here. We're going to press O to remove that overlay, which didn't really make sense. And then if you press U, it toggles between your anatomical data set and your functional data set. What we did in this uh, pre-processing -pre pipeline, this was a linear transformation. Um, Something I'm going to invite you to do when we have time for practice at the end of today is to, I'll show you the option to rerun this with nonlinear warping, and then you can compare the two, right? So a linear transformation is usually the default. Uh, but the things that I look for the most here, if I toggle between the two, is to make sure that these internal structures, particularly the ventricles, seem to line up. That's a very important part of registration. They recommend, the AFNI developers recommend that you look uh, to make sure that the internal structures show, uh, are roughly in alignment. Okay. So what I'm looking for is because I know that the contrast between a T1 and a T2 image are flipped, right? It's going to be bright in the ventricles for the T2 image. It's going to be dark in the ventricles for the T1 image. When I'm flipping between the two and looking at different slices, you know, do those two things roughly match up? You know, do the gyri and the sulci tend to follow the same uh, lines? You know, and it might be useful to blow one of these things up and then run through that as well. So what I'm looking for is, you know, these ventricles aligning. Also, something like this ridge right here of this sulcus, making sure that it follows roughly the same thing. Uh, I'm not going to look through every slice, but those are just a few of the major ones. Uh, take a few moments just to look through it, toggle the overlay, underlay, and make sure that it does a pretty good job. So there's no quantitative metric I can give you to say whether it did, whether it's, uh, you know, passes a certain threshold, right? But these are the basic things I look for. The reason I'm 
uh, talking so much about these internal alignments is that with uh, well compared to say SPM at least five or ten years ago what SPM and apnea uh, used to focus on was making sure that the outlines of the brain matched up really well but upon further inspection sometimes the internal structures did not show as good alignment and so if you look at anything within the outline of the brain which is basically everything we're interested in they could be off by a considerable amount. How much is too much? I mean, I really can't give you any objective measure. I'm just showing you what I look for when I eyeball it. Okay, Makes sense so far? So that's an important check to do, to check for registration. And I do it for both of these uh, images. Is the empty space on top of the cell better normal? I mean, is that from skull uh, I think that that is, I think that, yeah, that ridge seemed to be amplified during the registration process, but I don't think that that's an artifact. It's part of the dura that separates the cerebellum. Yeah, in, in the original image, it wasn't as exaggerated, but I wouldn't say that that's an actual uh, registration problem or failure. Okay, if I click on underlay and I go to Vol2, okay, same thing. So the anatomical image is still loaded in memory. I'm just going to, again, toggle between the two, look at a couple different slices, make sure it's okay. Now notice, around the outlines of the brain, you may see some discrepancies. That's okay. It's not ideal, but as part of this registration algorithm, the latest one that they have in AFNU, at least for linear transformations, you may see the outlines of the brain not matching up perfectly. Okay, it's a trade-off. They try to focus more on these internal structures. So I'll just show you again at that very, the frontal pole of the brain, it seems to be a little bit more uh, extended in the epi image. Just trying to show you there's no perfect alignment. Nonlinear may be better. You can check out for yourself during practice. Okay, the last thing I want to look at is the blur. So again, we're going to click on underlay and click on R01 blur. And then you got to click back into one of these viewers and press U to load the uh, blurred image. If it gets too confusing, you know, you can just X out of the whole thing, load Apne back up again, and select the blur as an underlay. If, if, if toggling between the two gets a little bit too confusing. Okay, so does everybody see something like this? Right, it's a little bit blurrier, yeah? That should make sense because we're applying a smoothing kernel to uh, interpolate between adjacent voxels. This is going to lead to less spatial specificity, but it should, in theory, increase our power when we run our model. That's the point of it. So all I'm looking for is just you know, make sure that it did blur a little bit. Uh, in the script, it blurred by 4 millimeters. Again, this is a parameter that you can change. Um, and near the end of the day, when we have an hour for some practice, I'll be giving you a couple of uh, recommendations for you know things you can test things you can change and test and see how that affects everything. <coughs> um, as far as scale, uh, there's nothing I really look for in terms of a quality check. It will look something like this and the important thing is if you look at the, if you're interested you look at the scale of this uh, time series. If you compare this to the original time series, the original time series, the uh, signal values are more or less arbitrary. But we, what we've done in scaling is made the average of the entire time series to be 100. So you see here at least the bottom is 97, top is about 102. So it's now roughly showing deflections from 100. Okay. So that's, that's really all that I'm looking for here. The last thing is going to be looking at, um, we'll get to statistics when we talk about first level analysis, 
is going to look at the normalization to this template. Right. In the script we used uh, MNI 152. X out of this for now. Okay, what, what I was hoping to do was, there's a file, okay, files that have a dot in, at, at the very front of them in Unix. These are called hidden files because they don't occur, you, you don't see them if you just type ls and hit return. You need to type a, an additional option to see it. But there is a file called .apne rc. I'll share a link with you afterwards of where the template is. But they have it on the apne website. And this is read each time the AFNI viewer is opened. The reason I like to change it is because you can specify a folder that gets read automatically every time the AFNI viewer opens. So I can put in something like the, the MNI template that, uh, that I warped everything to. I can put it in there. So then no matter where I open my AFNI viewer, they gets loaded into memory. And then I can overlay everything on top of that. It makes it makes it very easy. We can still do it by brute force because you have the MNI152 template in your Flanker directory. So we're just going to have to copy it into each subject's directory whenever we want to load it into memory, unfortunately. But um, to show you what this looks like, this is fun to play around with because you can change things like the color scheme, you can change what the defaults are when you open up the Gaffney viewer. Um, I'll give you a link to a video showing you how you how you do this. It's not terribly complicated, but the only thing that I've changed for today is AVNI Global Session, which points to a directory called A Global that I created. Could be anything, but you just point it to some directory, and then you put into that directory any data sets that you want to be opened up by default each time you open up the AVNI viewer. So you'll notice that in my computer, if I look in that A global directory, I have the MNI 152 template and also a Telerac Terno template. So that even though I'm in sub-01 results that does not have those data sets in that directory, they're still loaded into memory when I click on underlay. So let's see, do I have them here? Yes, MNI 152. And then I could overlay things such as my ANAT final uh, data set, right? So if you want to do a similar thing, all you need to do is from here, type ls dot dot slash dot dot. Notice you have the MNI underscore AVG 152 in your directory, yeah? So simply type uh, cp dot dot slash dot dot slash MNI. I'm going to use a wild card that represents you know, anything that begins with MNI, just copy that. And then a space, a dot, to copy that to my current directory. Okay? So th this is a workaround. It's, it does the same thing that that AFNI RC command did. So now when you open up AFNI, we want to check the normalization to see if anything went wrong or awry. Now in, if you open up underlay, that MNI AVG 152 is an option. So just open that up. Everybody see that? Yeah? Can you go back to the, um, the CPU? CPU? Yeah, sure. Can you kind of make a little bit smaller? You yes, yes. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, this, this command right here. Okay. Okay, we're all good? We all did that? Yeah? AVG 152, T1, yeah, I'll show you in a second. What should I do here? Okay. 
Going back to the AFNI viewer, so we have that as our underlay. And then what I like to check is both the NAT file, the one that was warped through the template space, and then let's say uh, anything bull right or after is actually in that template space. It has a plus TLRC extension, but remember that refers to anything that was normalized, whether it was Tallyrack or something else. So I click on overlay now and an at final. And then in any one of these viewers, again, type O to remove the overlay, and then U to toggle between the two to see if it was a good fit. So does that seem like a good fit? Anybody think it failed or did something kind of weird? Good? OK. So the next thing I'm going to look at is one of these overlays. Let's say, let's say one of these blurry images. <coughs> Just for kicks. And then again, you can press U to make sure that your functional images are now in template space. So the chain of steps that happens to do normalization is first, it takes your anatomical image and it warps that to some template image. Right? Because these template images, in almost all cases, they're a T1 weighted image. So your anatomical image looks the most like this template. So it, it matches that to the template. It sees how much it needs to warp it in each dimension to get it matching that template. And because during our registration step, our functional and our anatomical images are in alignment, it takes those same steps it needed to warp it, and it applies those to the functionals as well. So the anatomical image is almost like this uh, intermediary helping step to make sure that the functional images and the template are in alignment. Because it's the functional images that we're doing all the statistics on, and we're trying to do it in a template space. Does that turn out a uh, uh, matrix for you to use as well, like the registration matrix? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on here. So there's also this thing called a transformation matrix. Uh, we're not going to mess around with it too much, if at all. But basically, it's a text file that tells you exactly what it needed to do for all these different transformations. Remember the 12 degrees of freedom, that affine or linear transformation? It tells you in number <coughs> format, in a matrix format, what it had to do to do those alignments. So it's useful because not only for warping things to a template space, but in a more advanced uh, context, you may want to um, warp something to an anatomical space, use an atlas to create a mask, and then warp that back to original space if you're doing some kind of analysis in the single subject. If that didn't make sense, don't worry too much about it. It's, it's not that commonly done, but it gives you flexibility to go between this normalized space that everybody uh, is all on the same page about, and also going back to the original subject space, if say you're doing a, a, a case study or a single subject analysis. You could say I'm using a mask or some ROI defined in template space, but it's applied as best I can to this individual subject. Alternatively, you could just use a, a neuroanatomist to trace out some area instead of using an atlas, but we'll get to that tomorrow. Okay, so how did I generate this entire script? I'm going to go briefly through the Uber subject script, and then later uh, I'll be able to upload the, the output from that Uber subject script so that you can modify it during the practice portion. Okay. So I'm going to X out of this. Um, yeah. Well, let's get rid of that. Okay, now, if you ever install Apnea on your own machine, if you have a Mac, it usually, Apnea usually works best on, on Macs or a Unix system. If you get this command to work, ubersubject.py, very, very useful, and it's, it's recommended to create your scripts. Again, we want everything to be in somewhat standard format so that if you have a problem, you want to send it to the, the Apnea guys, you can definitely do that. You don't have Uber subject working on your machine, unfortunately. 
but I'm just showing you how I created that script, and then uh, you'll be able to modify that script later. Where is it located? Uber Subject. Yeah, is it on the it, it is in your library. It's in the Acme library, but oh. it's not going to work on these but machines. You have to, oh, okay. like copy like the same way that we copy them and I. No, no, you don't need to copy anything. This is in the in the default Acme library. <laughs> so with all the other commands like 3D skull strip, 3D alineate, like if you typed it, you'd be able to type it, but it's going to give you an error if it tries to open it up. It's run on Python. Anyway, so this ties together everything we talked about with the, the pre-processing. Um, you need to give it a subject ID. Usually I say, you know, SO1 or, you know, whatever. Really, this is just to create a, a template script that I'll then use to cycle through all my subjects. Group ID, let's call it flanker. And then analysis initialization. Can everybody see this okay? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So you have some options here. Usually the defaults are fine. But first it's going to ask you, is this a task data set or is it, say, a resting data set? Uh, the differences between the two, it's going to change some of the defaults for things like motion. Okay. Um, I keep talking about what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, but just be aware that uh, motion thresholds are much stricter in resting state analysis, and it also changes how it does some of the temporal filtering. Um, are you doing things on the volume or the surface? We don't have time to get into surface analysis, but it is an option uh, for more advanced users. Now, these processing blocks. So, key shifts. Okay, once we get familiar with the terminology, it becomes a little bit easier to, to decode this. T-shift is slice diamond correction. We do uh, alignment. TLRC means to do normalization. Again, not necessarily to a Telerec template, but any kind of template. Point registration, you blur it. You apply something called a mask to restrict your analysis only to brain voxels. And then it scales everything to 100 and does a regression, which is the focus of my next lecture. Now, if you want to change any of this, let's say you're doing an MVPA analysis, which we'll do tomorrow, and you don't want to do smoothing because you've read that smoothing actually decreases your classifier, classifier's accuracy. You would simply remove that and then hit apply, and it would tell you which ones were changed. That actually wasn't too informative. What did I do here? Right, you just remove that and then proceed with the rest of it uh, as before. So now, when you browse for these different data sets, I'll select this anatomical, this original anatomical data set. I would, you know, check to make sure that the anat has the skull because that changes what options it uses for skull stripping and also normalization. So if for some reason in your data set it's already been skull stripped, then you would uncheck that. You just need to make sure that you look at each of the steps and know what happens at each one of those. Epi data sets, so I'm going to go to the same subject, go to the func directory. Whoops, actually I can select both by holding shift and then opening both of them. And then stimulus timing files. Um, the main ones you got to know about are just congruent, incongruent. I'll explain those other ones during the lecture. But uh, usually for timing files, AFNI prefers everything to be in what's called a 1D format. It's essentially the same thing as text format, and if you give it a text file, it's not going to, to throw an error or anything. But usually the default is to have all of your stimulus files, anything that is, say, uh, timing file, motion parameters, anything like that, they have it in 1D format. I'll explain this during the lecture. This is just setting up my model. Uh, defaults are fine. I'm not going to mess around with it. The things that we did cover are things like the blur size. So if we want to change this from 4 to, say, 8, that's up to you. Depends what kind of regions you're looking at. 
and then this motion sensor limit, it's pretty, pretty stringent, 0.3 is pretty severe. Depending on your population, you may want to change this to something more lenient, 0.5 or 1 or, or whatever you have. So it's going to censor out any volumes that show a displacement from frame to frame, from volume to volume, greater than 0.3 millimeters. Again, pretty, pretty stringent, but uh, arguably it may give you better results. Okay. There are a bunch of other options. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I usually uncheck cluster simulation. There's a lot of stuff going on here. But after we run all of our regression, we usually get contiguous voxels that we have deemed significantly active, right? And what cluster simulation will do is uh, in real time, as you adjust this thing called the threshold slider in the AFNI viewer, when we look at the statistics, it will tell you if, this, if the cluster is significant or not. So it's convenient, it's not essential because, uh, as I'll show you, you can run those cluster simulations outside and then just know what the threshold is and then just apply that. Um, it takes a lot of time, so I usually uncheck it. But I do run this thing called 3D Remel Fit, which gets into these mixed effects models, which I promise I'll get to. Uh, usually all this is fine. Um, this command right here, uh, align using giant move. If you open up your Acne viewer and you, you set the, uh, the raw functional image as an underlay, the anatomical as an overlay, and you saw that they're, they were very, very, very far apart. Sometimes this happens when they you know, reset what the, the field of view is and what the, the origin is. You would want to check this. It's going to basically do a, a drastic move to try to align the centers and then use that as a starting point to do the rest of the registration. So it's a pretty good, pretty good option to use. And then for the template, their default is the tally rack turn no and 227. I like the MNI average 152. So this is all being recorded. You know, use this for reference after the workshop if you want to, to use this on your own. Um, these three buttons I just go through consecutively. This first one tells you what the command it's going to run to generate the script that has all the different commands in it. So it's like a meta script, right? It's a wrapper. So this AFNI proc py is what's going to be generated. Um, this is just a review. I'm not going to talk about that too much. This actually uh, generates the script. Okay. So on the previous slide, it said, you know, AFNI proc py it has a bunch of different options. This actually executed it and then creates a really, really, really long uh, proc file that contains each of the individual commands for each individual run. And then if I actually want to run it, I simply click on this go button. Okay, so that's how I created the script that you used. I'll briefly look, uh, look over that. So it's called, I call it proc flanker. Um, And you can also look at this as well. I'm using something called the VI or V editor. It's called it's short for visual editor. It's a pretty old school Unix editor. Uh, not an immediately intuitive, but if you type VI, then the name of the proc file, it opens up something like this. You can scroll through it by using the up and down arrows or hit Control then D or U to go down or up by a paragraph or two. Excuse me, what is the name of this? Proc underscore flanker, and it should be in your flanker directory. So notice, this contains all of the individual commands that we're going to use. What I'm going to provide you for uh, this practice session on your own is that original AFI proc py script, which creates this. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple options for things that you can change. Then you can run it on a single subject. It should take five minutes, ten minutes tops, and then you can compare some different things like whether you 
chose to do a, a nonlinear registration or not. So 3D TCAD, we're seeing a lot of familiar things here. Um, some commands that I haven't gotten into just because we, we don't have the time for it. Uh, T shift, that's why it's time of correction. There's alignment, right? There's TLRC, which is warping everything. So, you know, it's something you can, you can look through at your ledger. Okay, so that's ubersubject.py, very useful. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So we've gotten some familiarity with the AFNI viewer. We've looked at uh, some of the different steps, seen what's going on. Now we're going to get into the modeling part, both single subject and group analysis. Yeah? Are we ready to proceed, power through? Don't need to take a break? All right.